Ooh, first question. If you could play squash against any one player, dead or alive, who would it be? Um, I kind of don't know if you mean competitively or not, because I would have loved to have played, say, like Sarah Fitzgerald when um, she was at her best and I was at my best. Um, I played her a lot, though, in practice when I was growing up and she was based in Manchester and I absolutely loved it. Um, so that one kind of springs to mind for sure as kind of a competitive match. Um, I kind of feel like maybe on the men's side, I did a few coaching sessions with Peter Nicol and that was pretty, pretty good. I, um, I really enjoyed that. So I feel like um, playing some of the, the men, like it, you really get a different feel for how the game's played when you play some of the men. So maybe getting on court with like Jonah Barrington would be amazing too. I was able to when he was a bit younger and and stuff. Yeah. Um, what was the most challenging moment physically? Um, that's a tough one. So, I guess um, I guess partly like part of overcoming kind of starting to get a few more wins over Nicole um, included getting myself a lot better physically um, and then so kind of overcoming physical challenges was almost being able to take myself to let's say kind of training places that were particularly painful <laughs> um, for example I used to be a complete baby when it came to doing any sort of track sessions I mean I'd literally be in the worst mood before I was about to start and you know borderline kind of in tears because I knew what was about to happen luckily as I got a little bit better, um, that that as I got a little bit better and a bit older and a bit more confident, I started to handle them a bit better. But I'm a bit rubbish at going through kind of that physical pain, um, which I guess is like challenging, isn't it? But part of that learning those those mental skills, part of that comes from kind of training those mental skills when you're in pain um, in training as well. And then I guess from a physical perspective, um, the most challenging moments are obviously injury. Um, I was really lucky with injury through my career in that I didn't have, um, you know, really, really severe sort of long injuries. But the worst one I had was um, a pretty bad ankle sprain, left ankle. I've done my left ankle three times. But it's like the worst injury that I've really had in my career. Um, and the second time I did it, it was pretty much as bad as you can do an ankle and I had bruising up to kind of two thirds up my shin and um, bright purple on the inside so it was pretty challenging to kind of overcome that because obviously you, don't, you can't walk and you don't know how long it's going to be and then there's a lot of swelling even when you're back on court so just sort of staying positive and making sure that you kind of recover properly and understanding that making sure that you get that full recovery back to on court is the most important thing without rushing it too much. Pricey, do you eat cake? You know, I've been making your stuff in lockdown. <laughs> um, yes. And do you know what, guys, for anyone who doesn't follow me on Instagram, it's probably going to expire very shortly. But I made these amazing Belgian waffles last night. Obviously, I'm a year retired now, so don't judge. But it was next level stuff. So it's like a dough that gets, it gets made through the day and um, has to rise like a bread dough, a brioche dough. And then you add in these sugar pearls, which I had no idea what they were. And um, so I had to get them, mix them in and then stick them on my waffle maker, next level stuff. So Tinny Gillis actually meant, uh, messaged me on Instagram this morning and was like, they look really good. And I felt pretty honored from a Belgian to, hear that so yeah if you want to see what i've been baking instagram's the place for that <laughs> um what's the best training for improving an average club player solo practice matches routines fitness um i guess um yeah i think actually i'm just trying to think on the spot here i mean you need all of them don't you but let's be honest you can't actually do matches and certain routines at the moment i think the one thing I've learned during lockdown in terms of fitness is trying to do sessions that are most specific to squash. So I've been doing a lot of Zoom workouts and, you know, although we all need a burpee occasionally just for hard work, 
Um, we actually also, you know, kind of need really squash specific type movements and a burpee while it adds a lot of fitness doesn't necessarily add anything that we're going to do on court. So I've been doing kind of these technical fitness sessions, which have been going down really well where, you know, you're doing a lunge, but you're thinking about doing a lunge that is specific to kind of on court. Um, so it's like, it's a bit of a different take on the zoom workouts and they've been going down really well. And generally, you know, at the end of the day, it just makes it really, really interesting for people. Um, because who wants to just do lunges for a minute when you could be thinking about how I'm going to lunge in to play a certain shot, the way you lunge in to play a lob is very different to how you'd lunge in to do a drop shot, for example. So that's been really interesting. So it's sort of what I guess my answer is, how can you link the fitness to the squash? Um, and that's a really good way of doing your fitness work. Um, solo practices are great as are kind of watching squash TV and um, brilliant way to learn and copy. Obviously it's great to just try and copy and, um, be like some of the top pros that you like to play with. Um, I actually recently downloaded an app that I've been using with some of my players. Um, it's kind of been great because it's obviously during lockdown, I'm just trying to find the name of it. It's called slow-mo if you can see that. So basically um, you can video yourself just on your iPhone and then you can import it into that app. You can slow it down super slow-mo. Um, and it's been brilliant for being able to see things that you don't realize are going on with your swing. And half the time, especially with amateur players and with pros, they're like, yeah, I don't do that with my swing. I don't have you know my racket in this position at certain times. And then you look at it in real slow-mo and you actually do. So, you know, why not just kind of video yourself just on your iPhone and then import that video to the app and have a, t have a look, see how your swing looks broken down and, and how, it's, uh, how it compares to maybe some of the pros and stuff. Ooh, my book, uh, when is my book coming out? So um, it's almost written, it's with the um, editors. It's got a bit of editing to do. Um, so it's, it's exciting. Originally it was that it was going to be out before Christmas with lockdown and um, not being able to promote it the way that I would and just being able to do, you know, I'd love to do a book tour. I'd love to do um, visiting some clubs and visiting some um, events where I can maybe sign some copies and sell it. I'm just not going to be able to do that right now. So we've kind of got, you know, a rough idea of launching at an event early in the new year, depending on whether or not events are running and whether crowds are allowed. Um, with a backup of kind of pushing back to March, April time if needed. So I'm really excited to um, kind of, you know, get the finished article and we're just looking at book covers right now, which is exciting. And um, yeah, um, kind of adding in some funny stories as well. So um, kind of, as, as everyone will know, I was quite a serious player. So the book's, you know, a bit serious at times. So trying to think of you know there's some funny stuff that happened on tour and um, particularly with my coach dp and nick um so yeah trying to think of some funny stories and kind of getting them in as well so i hope you guys are really looking forward to it and i'm really excited to share it hopefully early in the new year at the moment is the best chance how do you avoid injury uh the longer you've been playing i have lots of shoulder and elbow pain do you have any suggestions Mm, it's a toughie. Um, so personally for me, I found the best thing for injury prevention, um, well, the best thing actually for injury is, is to prevent the injury, which sounds stupid, but I was also, I was always trying to kind of um, try and find a way to keep injury free rather than kind of get an injury and then try and cure it. So for me personally, I found the best way to do that was um, yoga. Um, specifically because I struggled more with like lower back and hip issues um, shoulder and elbow is a toughie because that sounds like it could be a technical thing maybe um, so revert back to slow-mo app and have a look what your swing's doing but shoulders particularly there's some great yoga sessions out there for shoulder mobility and spine and everything that goes with that um, it sounds silly again, but prevention is better than cure. So I would regularly be trying to book in with book in with a physio or a massage uh, for a massage or for, um, a chiropractor even. Um, and I try to book it in sort of, you know, very kind of, you know, maybe once a month and just book it in, book the next one in when you go four or five weeks later. 
And generally, even if you don't feel like you need a treatment, when you go, if the person is good enough quality, then you will, they'll always find something, whether it's an alignment that might just prevent an injury or whether it's just something that's getting tight that maybe could, could get tighter and tighter and then create an issue. That was sort of the biggest tip that I had where I tried to plan things in ahead of time um, and then just stick to going with them, even though it, you know, got to put your hand in your pocket a bit for the money. <laughs> what is a typical day like now you're retired? Um, coffee. <laughs> um, generally, um, wake up and have a coffee every morning. And I've, I've got to be really careful with what I eat now in terms of, you know, if I want to bake all these cakes and eat all these cakes, then I really need to be careful what I'm eating through the day. So i um, definitely cut down on sort of what I'm eating. So I'm having smoothies for my breakfast. Um, generally around to walk the dog every day, uh, Woody. So that's been really enjoyable. And then and then off to the club now the last the last couple of weeks or if we sort of say before lockdown I was doing you know a fair bit of coaching and um, getting on with a lot of the club players and um, really enjoying that really, really real level of different levels of players and then working with some pros as well so that was brilliant I'm um, involved in the county setup which is really exciting because the county setup for me was such a huge part of my growing up that I kind of want to get that that county feel back into junior squash so I hope that I can help with with that with the Lancashire stuff um working with England squash as well which is exciting trying to help with the particularly the young girls that are coming through kind of early 20s trying to help them and teach them how things are um, and how to improve on tour and then I guess lastly like one of my roles that I that I'm excited about is working with Head who are my racket sponsor and um, got to go and visit their HQ in February in Austria and that was unbelievable being able to see how a racket is made I wish I genuinely wish I'd, I'd, I'd seen that earlier I felt like giving my racket a little hug after I'd been to the factory because um, the amount of care and attention and detail that goes into making a racket was just unbelievable so um, yeah really kind of you know, excited to be working with Head as their pro player consultant and uh, getting some players on board, hopefully, and keeping the ones that we've already got. So, yeah, really excited about that. Greetings from Canada. Uh, how do you remain mentally strong when things don't go your way in a match? Um, well, I think I sort of touched upon it briefly before about how a lot of the mental training kind of comes from the physical training that you do. Um, I think, I think for me, kind of, I guess it depends on what you mean by being mentally strong. Um, setting yourself a goal before you go on court is, is really important. I think like for me, I was, um, you know, really, really clear on my game plan. Um, and then I sort of went on and tried to play relaxed and relaxed for me, um, stick to that game plan and then sort of have in my head, if I lose this match, but I've managed to kind of, you know, play the way that I want to play, then I shake my opponent's hand and just say, well done. So I think in some ways that's kind of a really good perspective to keep you mentally strong. Um, because then you sort of, you're not going to go mentally weak or become frustrated when the score's not going your way. Um, and you always have a point of reference to go back to with the, with the game plan. So I think setting out a game plan before you go on court is, is really important for being able to stay mentally focused, which then kind of impacts being mentally strong, doesn't it? Um, and then that mental, that mental strength that really comes, you know, that old say is the Mike Tyson saying, isn't it? Like everybody has a plan until they get punched on the nose. And in squash, punched on the nose is kind of like six hard rallies where you can't breathe anymore. Are you just going to mentally crumble and be steamrolled? Or are you going to actually be able to, taking kind of um the, a deep breath and recover and push and go again and that actually is what a lot of people i think see as what mentally strong is it's the ability to be able to be mentally strong when you're tired because everything kind of goes a bit weak and a bit soft when you're tired and that's when a lot of players will go away so although it sounds crazy like training that that real like physical strength will massively impact your mental strength I think if I've made sense there 
Um, what do you think about the growing trend in squash to use more aggressive shots and end the rallies and get the point as quickly as possible? Um, if you've got the skills, why not? <laughs> I think if I had the skills, I probably would have done too. But one of the things for me was about, um, I was always a bit, I don't want to say scared, but I hated to end the rally on a tin. I hated to sort of end the rally where it was my fault. Um, and so at times I struggled with that balance between being really positive in my play and then being a little bit negative, refusing shots that were on. And so I had to work through that my entire career. So I guess it would be kind of like, it's that kind of risk v reward, isn't it? Kind of, you want to go for your shots, of course, but you actually want to make sure that you're able to, um, you know, do it in a way that's not going to lose you the point more than a few times in a row. So um, my my style of play was always sort of like try and hit to the back and volley as much as you can and wait for your opportunity. Um, so it's just a fine line between how long you wait, isn't it? Um, whereas when I'd play someone like Raneem, for example, who would be unbelievable, my job was just to sort of tie her down, you know, put the ball on the sidewall, put the ball deep, make her play from really tough positions and then almost counter attack. And I'm sure from her point of view, she was probably trying to go with me for an element of that and like wait for the right opportunity, but it was just not in her instincts as much. So I think that's what my outlook of the play was. But I think in, if you mean sort of like the way that the, the trend is going with kind of, you know, people wanting to play all these fancy shots, maybe when it's not the right thing to do, then I'm, I'm not really for that. And um, yeah, like the sooner I realized what my style of play was and the best way for me to get the best results for me and my skills and my talent, um, that's when I kind of accepted that I needed to play a certain way. And that's when I probably had my best results as well. Um, what do you do for daily recovery work? Um, so yeah, while I was playing, I guess um, a lot of foam rolling, a lot of stretching. Um, obviously nutrition comes into your recovery. I was actually dairy free for, um, I still am as much as possible aside from a bit too much chocolate. I don't have an intolerance, but I kind of done a lot of research behind um, dairy has um, an inflammatory effect on the body. And it's nothing that I think normally we can't handle, but as athletes and people who are training really hard, I guess, even at amateur, even at amateur level, there's, um, there comes a point where that infl the inflammation that we're doing with lactic acid and the inflammation on the joints that particularly squash would probably have, you've already got a heck of a lot of inflammation in your body that your body has to try and clear. So with dairy, for example, it would add on another layer of inflammation and um, that your body had to work to clear. So I did a bit of research around that. It's totally personal to me, but um, tried to stay dairy free as much as possible. Very strict with it at events um, because I think that it, it impacted my play a lot. So in terms of recovery, um, that's how my diets probably impacted it. Enough water and um, recovery shakes. Um, after training to make sure that you're recovering well. Um, I also used to use um, creatine for recovery and um, making sure that I'm getting, you know, all the right proteins. I was using leucine for a bit as well. So yeah, a lot, I kind of got into my nutrition for, especially around, around that kind of time when I got to world number one, I was really lean and really on my nutrition a lot. So I think it's a really good way to kind of recover. And then, yeah, the yoga, as I've already mentioned, foam rolling, stretching, regular massage, keeping up with your physio. And I think it links in a little bit to what I said before, but hopefully that helps. Um, have you ever been to Russia? No. Do you want to play some big tournaments here or maybe a show match on uh, in the Red Square in Moscow? Yes. <laughs> Actually, um, I did get a message on Instagram the other day about maybe going to Russia to kind of um, have a look at maybe opening some new courts. So maybe when coronavirus is over, I could be making a trip to Russia. Um, but yeah, I actually really would love to go, um, especially to Moscow and look, um, you know, look around a bit. So hopefully I can make it out there one day. I haven't been yet. 
Um, what are good solo drills to run through when on court by yourself? Um, so the one downside I always feel with solo practice is when you're working on your swing and your technique, the downside with solo practice is, right, you're going to get both feet under the ball and you're just going to hit. So normally you have, obviously, your opponent plays a shot, you play a shot. So you have real time to kind of, you know, really finish your shot, follow through and everything, maybe move back to the tee. So the downside of solo practice for me is um, that you can't actually practice technical stuff as much as you could. You could. I'm a massive fan of ball machines. Um, had a squash cannon for a while, and it was a massive, massive aid and a bonus because you can move on to the ball like a solo practice, but just do that. They are very expensive. Um, so my advice to be like for good solo drills is actually kind of um, try to move as much as you can, even though you're in solo. So, you know, you should have a really good sweat on, even though you're still solo in. So if you're driving down the wall, at least make a little bit of an effort to get back to that middle T line, not back to the T as such, obviously, but back to the sort of middle T line. Um, and this, and then as a progression to that, if there's something specific that you're trying to work on with your technique or with your movement, kind of feed yourself up almost like a high drop shot and move into the ball and practice playing those drives or feed yourself up a boast and then practice that shot sort of like, you know, backhand boast, move in, forehand drive down the wall and make sure that you're hitting those those shots in a way that you would do in a match. Um, obviously, the massive positive of solo is that you can just hit repeatable balls you can just get you know twice as many balls hit on your own as you could with a pair so that's the bonus but I guess just make sure that you're doing it in the right sort of way um yeah and then another good solo drill just for that sort of stuff to make sure that you keep moving is kind of like one in the service box one cross court into the other service box one in the service box one cross court into the other service box and although obviously in a match you're never going to practice hitting the service box what you are practicing is accuracy and accuracy is you know does the ball go where you want it to go where you're trying to hit it so whether that's loose off the sidewall or into a service box do you have ball control because if you can hit the ball where you want it to go then you can hit it where you want it to go when it's a length or a drop or whatever so it's about swing control ball control and then moving at the same time so i really like that one um but there's loads on kind of like squash skills and and youtube and things like that it might be a good one to do on my youtube channel actually so i might think about that next one you played nicole for a long period um and this new generation of egyptian players such as Renima and shabini too what do you think are the main differences between the modern game and the past traditional game um well obviously the tin is a huge difference the point of rally scoring is a second huge difference those were both things that were out of my control and things that i had to adapt to while i was trying to play um I think um, it was funny when Shabini came on tour because um, she started to play Nicole and being um, like the same age as Nicole and having, I mean, nine times Nicole beat me before I managed to get my first win. There's only like, there's mental stuff going on there as well. Um, from my perspective, I used to call it with my psychologist, like you'd be able to, it's like you've got a scar from somebody when Nicole was very good at that kind of make putting all a mental scar on you. So even if, even in my later career, if I beat her, it was never easy. It was always hard. And I always had to have a word with myself before I go on court about how much I'm willing to push myself in this match to actually kind of, you know, dig in and am I prepared to go to the place it's going to take to beat her. And when Shabini came on tour, she kind of didn't really have any of these like mental scars as such. And I don't know if that played a part or not, but she was sort of the low tin came along and it kind of looked like she just went, well, why am I not going to just finish the rally? I'm just going to finish the rally. Um, and then you obviously need the skills to do that. So I think it was a change in the tin, a change in the scoring. The, the game became a little bit less physical in terms of attritional play, not as long, although more fast and dynamic in a different way. Um, and then a new breed of player coming through and kind of not quite having these same mental blocks as such. Um, but I think just, you know, the Egyptian women kind of just came on and they just they just play with ag aggression and skill and they want to play to the front of the court. And 
I guess that's what it takes sometimes to just change the game from what it was to kind of what it is. And there's always changes happening. And sometimes they're so subtle that you don't realize they're happening until you look back and think, wow, that game's actually significantly different now than what it was five years ago. So um, I'd say just, yeah, the attacking play to the front. Um, obviously, the Egyptian girls were doing that from the start, even when I was young, um, younger, like NG and Omnia and Man El Amir and all of these these Egyptian girls who were very good back when I started playing, but kind of Renim and um, Noor, they sort of came on tour and they had these skills, but they've also started to really back it up with the physicality as well. Um, and that's made a huge difference because now they've got kind of what, let's say, the English players had back in the day with this huge amount of physicality, um, but they've also got the attacking play as well. And I think that's probably been you know, something for the rest of us to get to grips with or not me anymore, but everyone who's coming through, you've got to be able to defend the short ball. And I think the future of the women's game will be like, you have to be able to attack and you have to be fit, but you also have to move well to be able to defend the attack in play. And that's when the game will probably move on to the next level as well, I'd imagine. Um, hi, Laura, when you travel to um, places such as Egypt for a tournament where um, you can't find your favorite meals, how do you manage your diet and be able to be at your best? Great question. Um, you buy another bag's worth of extra luggage and take your own. <laughs> um, honestly, some of the trips I made, particularly to Egypt, India, um, two, two places particularly where the food is just so different um, from anything that we would have in the UK. I, I would literally take things that I was allowed to travel with, like loads of snacks, um, nuts, seeds, you know, dried fruit. Um, I would take kind of the healthy noodle parts that you can get from kind of Itsu and um, different, there's loads out there that are really healthy now and that they're not full of, you know, E numbers and stuff. I would take pizza breads, literally. So I'd literally be having my, my stuff in my room, um, you know, even down to kind of like tuna pots and things like that, if you were allowed to take them to the country. So um, I would take a lot myself. Um, and then kind of just ask around when I'm there, you know, generally a lot of players have always traveled to those places before the older players, for example. Um, and then you might travel repeatedly to that same venue or country. And then you know where you can go and what kind of sits well with your stomach. And um, yeah, I, I kind of just make sure I play it really safe for the first couple of days. Um, I kind of watch a lot and see where other players um, and people who um, are on the kind of tour with us, whether it's the support staff or kind of, you know, PSA, I watch where they eat. And if they're still looking pretty good the next day, then um, then I'll definitely kind of um, be following their footsteps. And then alongside that, making sure that you've got really good protein shakes and recovery shakes with you, hydration tablets, things like that. Always have like, um, you know, loads, loads of things to snack on um, is the main thing. Same with, with flights really. Um, and then kind of just making sure that you're trying to pick good choices. So if you're in the hotel, obviously that you've still got a choice, like having any restaurant to pick um, a healthy one or not. So it's really just dealing with uh, what you've got and trying to make sensible choices, I think. Uh, at what age did you actually start competing competitively and what encouraged you to keep going? Um, so I think probably one of my earliest tournaments I mean certainly on sort of should we say like a national level a UK level I played in my first British national championships at um 11 I think under 12 so I must have been 11 I I got battered by the number two in the country at the time um in the quarterfinal I think so it was a bit of a wake-up call um I was playing locally in some smaller tournaments I think around kind of 10 11 um and then, yeah, I started to take it a little bit more seriously. I'm not 100% sure. Those memories are kind of faded a bit to the back of my memory. But um, I was definitely traveling a lot more um, when I got to the age of like 14, 15. And it's really tough. Um, what encouraged me to keep going is, you know, wanting to be better, I guess. And some people say they love the sport and they love the friends and they love the travel and it kind of wasn't really that for me I just was quite good at squash and I was winning a lot and um I liked winning 
Um, and so when I lost, it hit me hard. Um, it was something that I had to deal with a lot through my senior career as well, how that, you know, you get quite down after losses. Um, so it's kind of good to, you know, um, you know, learn that as my career went on, I got a lot better at handling my losses, which then in turn sort of created less nerves because when you're really worried about losing, you obviously get really nervous with that. Um, so yeah, I think the, I think the main thing is, um, remembering why you played for me, it was maybe a bit more on the winning side than the fun side, but that's what sort of the encouragement you're playing because you're enjoying it. And if you're not enjoying it, there's an issue. Or if you're playing because you want to win and you're not winning, then you need to change something in your training to um, make sure you're giving yourself a bit of a better chance. So I was encouraged a lot by my family as well. And, um, you know, kind of, kind of wanted to do well and I wanted to make them proud. And that was something that always helped me bounce back um, as well as I could do, I think. Um, are there any chances of a comeback? No. <laughs> Not uh, not with the amount of cake I've eaten in lockdown, for sure. Um, and to be honest, um, I'm kind of really happy in retirement. Um, I injured my knee after I'd retired, which was, I was talking about injuries before. The reason I didn't mention it was because it wasn't actually part of my career. And I think I was trying to play Lisa Aitken in a, a Premier Squash League match in October. Um and something crazy in me was like, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to lose this match. And I was thinking, I'm retired. Why do I care? And then, you know, I was one nil up and about three, one in the second or something. And I went in for a ball and she, you know, forehand drop shot. And she sort of nudged my hip on as she came through and all of my weight went right. And my foot stayed where it was. And I dislocated my kneecap and tore my MCL. So worst injury I've had in my whole career, post career, <laughs> um, mainly I think because I was trying to play pro squash while not conditioned for it, brain knew what I was doing, body didn't want to do it anymore. Um, and so I'm really even struggling to kind of just play um, for fun at home at the moment. I'm fit and I'm getting stronger and I'm able to do routines, but what it made me kind of appreciate is my body and how good I was physically when I was on tour. And I really enjoyed that part of it. And I think one of the reasons I really struggled to keep my consistency up in that last season or two was just because I'm 36 um, and the body slows down and women particularly kind of, you know, struggle to keep hold of the muscle. And I could just tell that within myself and then very quickly players caught on to the fact that you aren't what you once were. And then although people say that you're very mentally strong, you're only as mentally strong as you're physically able to. So um, that was a very long-winded answer for, no, I'm not coming back because I'm done. <laughs> um, what is your daily routine like during vacation? Well, you can't have a routine on vacation, can you? Um, depends where I'm going, but generally I'd pick somewhere sunny. Um, loads of just, you know, sunbathing, reading a book, trying to come down mentally, I think um, probably after about four or five days, I start to get a little bit itchy feet in terms of um, wanting to do some sort of workout just because I think you feel better. I, th I personally feel better when I'm working out and sweating and feeling like I'm earning my dinner at night. So yeah, I'd probably still hit the gym um, just to do something or go for a run on a beach, depending on where I am. And and just try and relax and come down a little bit mentally and, you know, read some books, listen to some podcasts um, have a few drinks at night and just enjoy the vacation a little bit. That's, that's what it's for. Um, how much cardio stroke running every day is necessary to improve your game? Ooh, I don't know. It kind of ties in, I guess it depends what level you are, but um, probably ties in a little bit to, um, the level that you're playing at, you know, the, what we just said about kind of the game moving on and the game being quicker. I've done quite a lot of running during lockdown and I don't think it's particularly helped my speed on court and me feeling like it's helped my calves and my feet stay strong. But in terms of like cardio, um, there's probably nothing better than actually just ghosting for cardio. I think bike is actually really good as well because then you're working your cardio. You're also working kind of really strong legs. Um, but at the same time, um, 
you're kind of not getting that impact through the hips and ankles and knees and stuff. So personally, obviously squash is cardio too. So you can't forget that. So if we take squash out of the equation, I would probably be doing one running session a week, which doesn't sound like a lot, but I mean, that was honestly all I felt like I need. And then maybe two bike sessions, some of which might be kind of on the back of a squash session. Um, and I would do a lot of ghosting um, and stuff like that. So I, yeah, I'm not a huge long cardio kind of person. I feel like squash is, it's multi kind of directional and so there and multi speed. So you need to train that in your cardio as well. And I hope, I hope that makes sense. Um, where are we up to there? Um, I've watched you live a number of times and your commitment is inspiring. Thank you. Your best match I watched was against Nicole David. Um, what was she like to play? Uh, so you never said which match that was. Did I win it? <laughs> um, best match I watched was against Nicole. I'm assuming I won it if it was my best, if it was the best match you watched. Um, she was so tough to play. Um, like I said earlier, kind of from, from the perspective of like, without doubt, every single time you stepped on court with Nicole, you knew it was going to be hard. And so then you had a choice, right? We have a choice. Um, and it doesn't always look like it in squash, but there comes a point in a rally or a match where you have a choice to stick to the game plan and, you know, dig your heels in. Or for me, it would be put a forearm boast in and try and win the rally. And it's sort of kind of one of those shots where it's like, it's the rally's over. This is either going to be a winner or this is going to be an errors type thing, you know, or you go for an unnecessary drop shot or a volley drop or something like that. And I think more than anybody else, Nicole made you um, question like, you know, how soon in the match are you going to start to play these silly shots? How soon are you going to break? And, you know, I remember being in, you know, before a match several times in the hotel room, kind of almost asking myself that exact question. How hard are you willing to push today? Because although it never looks like you can get out of a rally, I think we all know really that when we know the, the right shot is to play the ball back down the wall and contain our opponent or, you know, put, put it in a certain place, then the brain sort of goes, yeah, but I want to go for that drop shot because if it wins the rally, it's over. And oh, if I hit the tin, it's over as well. So I think she made you question that more than anybody. Um, she also made you, she was the one person I was always the most shocked and DP, my coach and I had a lot of conversations about the amount of balls that she got back. Um, you'd put in a, a shot and, ex, and you know, sometimes I literally felt myself walking towards the service box thinking the rally was over and it would come back. How do you then not let that pressure of the ball keep coming back sort of build up in the back of your mind? And we talked a lot about resetting the rally, it, meaning if I put a shot in and it came back, that doesn't mean that the pressure then builds. It just means that the next shot we had of a mindset of just, Put the ball back in play like it was serving again so that that mental pressure of nicole getting more and more balls back didn't start to kind of weigh so that you then because the worry is then that you go lower on the tin to try and make sure that she doesn't get the ball back and then that's when you hit the errors so um i would say she was extremely tough to play she was extremely fast um and you know obviously she's one of the greats but um yeah, one of, one of my biggest achievements, I think, was sort of being able to kind of get some wins over her and, you know, figure out a way on how to do that a, a little bit is something I'm really proud of. How do head rackets compare with the Technofiber rackets? Ooh, I've never played with a Technofiber racket. How am I supposed to answer that? Um, they're just better. End of. No. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, I feel like, you know, I don't know. I, I actually honestly have not played with a Technofiber racket. I've, I don't even think I've ever held one. Maybe, maybe just, I don't, I honestly don't think I've held one. So 
I can only comment on my head racket, which is uh, the one thing I always say, extremely durable. I've hardly broken any in my entire career, particularly the normal body frames. We've actually just brought out um, a couple of seasons ago, a slim body, um, which means the frame's a little tighter, uh, thinner, because the head frames are notoriously a little thick, um, which makes it sometimes harder to get the ball off the wall, particularly for amateurs. So there's now slim body versions, which are really thin frames. Um, so they're, they're great, a great option and um, yeah, great balance, balance of racket. And I mean, I personally have played with them. I won all my major um, titles with them. So I um, really like them. Uh, next question. Do you think Lucy Tamel has a chance to reach world number one? Is that Lucy in disguise? <laughs> um, Enzo. And so is asking that question. Um, I mean, I, I honestly wouldn't put my money on anyone reaching world number one like kind of from like 40 in the world you know kind of picking that number like yes i'd put you know a, a big amount of money on someone kind of reaching world number one but the one thing that more than one thing the thing that lucy has going for her um which is extremely positive and i think the well, one thing that you really need is that she's got an absolutely brilliant work ethic um she listens although she can argue back a little bit at times but i also think that's quite a good quality um you know kind of don't want someone who's just going to follow blindly you kind of want someone who understands what it takes and then listens but if they doubt you can't sort of ask questions so it becomes a bit of a dialogue um you know i've been working with her through lockdown on um some really good stuff that add, adds to her game and we've known a lot of remote remote coaching which has been brilliant because we've never done that before. And it's been something that we've really found worked quite well for us during lockdown. And I, you know, I've seen some really big improvements in her. So I think when you say to someone, you know, would they reach world number one? That's so difficult. I didn't even think that I would make world number one. <laughs> so, um, so much is dependent on, you know, injury and other players and stuff. But in terms of kind of becoming world class, if you sort of say what, you know, what's world class, maybe top 10, top 15 is, you know, top 20 maybe is world class. Um, then yeah, I think she's certainly got the capability to push herself to become up there and start to become a nuisance to a lot of the top players. And then, and then as those wins come, you learn, don't you? You learn, you move on, you learn again, you, you learn what you need to improve on as well. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful for her that she can and I'll help her um, as much as I can and then it's over to her. Um, from Andy, what is it like playing uh, vocal feisty players? How does it affect your mentality on court? Well, would I have been classed as one of them vocal feisty players? I guess I feel like feisty, maybe vocal at certain times with my commands. Um, so I guess, I guess the one thing that I can now say while I'm retired, now I'm retired, that the one thing I hated actually, because I was quite feisty and not always vocal, vocal in terms of saying a lot of stuff, but I would shout, come on, um, at certain times, I think, the one thing that I really disliked was someone getting back in my face doing it because I know that when I do that to players, um, it has the effect of kind of making them go in their shell a little bit. It makes, it makes me seem bigger than I am. Um, it makes them know that I'm here to stay and that I'm going to get stuck in. And if I timed it right, then, you know, I could do those come ons at certain times of the match that made sure I then pushed on for the rest of the game. And when someone did it back to me, I, I found it quite hard to kind of not go in my shell myself um, because it, it does have that effect. When someone stands up and they're tall and they shout at you in any situation, you have to be a really strong kind of, you know, um, personality to not let that affect you in any way. So I guess I started to realize that through my career, I realized that when someone did it back to me, which very few people actually did, um, when I did realize that I didn't like it, I could catch it. So at least I knew I didn't like it. And I might have that effect of kind of recoiling or, you know, sinking in my body language, but then very quickly could kind of overcome that and 
you know, take a second and make sure I grew my stance back, get some positive thoughts or positive, you know, kind of like focus on the next rally. What's the plan? What am I going to do? And get that out of my head and try and stand up again so that it didn't actually affect the play, even though it had affected me a little bit between rallies. Um, so I think, I, I hope that helps. So I'm, I'm not sure I've answered the question there. <laughs> Uh, from Vic, what needs to be done to get squash included in the Olympics? I don't know. Uh, I honestly don't know. I, I don't actually know what to say to this question. Obviously, you can imagine how much I've got asked this question. Um, I mean, I'm a bit of a believer in kind of like just get the tour rocking. It, it was rocking before lockdown. Get it better. Get it bigger. And then it'll sort of happen when it's ready. But I know, I know it doesn't happen when it's ready and you've got to do all of the, you know, got to, you know, do all the application processes and all that. But it just seems like we're actually not getting any closer. And although an Olympic medal would be brilliant, um, you know, world champion, British Open, World Series finals, you know, world teams, all that sort of stuff. There's some pretty big things that you can achieve in squash. So when all of those things are, are, are big enough to kind of happen, then you know, I think, I think when the tour gets big enough and the, and the viewership gets big enough and the money gets big enough, then, you know, we'll hopefully get in, um, without having too much of a fight. But until then, it's just really frustrating because a lot of sports that are our own size, if not smaller in a lot of ways, have got that Olympic inclusion. So I don't know what else to say. I'm really sorry. It's very frustrating. Hey, Laura, do you think that squash is more athletic uh, than tennis or not? How and why? Uh, I guess short answer, yes. Um, purely because of, um, I think the stats show um, heart rates, long, how long the rallies are, distance covered. But, you know, it's a different sport, isn't it? It's so hard to compare. So, you know, the power that's needed in tennis for those like, you know, three, four shots, the serve, um, the dynamic power that's needed and um, the different type of movement, the heaviness of the balls, the heaviness of the racket. There's so much strength and power needed in tennis that I think that goes, um, you know, a little bit unrecognized in terms of the comparison a little bit. Um, I guess um, squash, uh, tennis like squash and like all other sports is just getting more physical too, isn't it? The rallies are getting longer, baseline rallies more than, you know, volleying and stuff. So I do think squash is harder, but it's also significantly shorter. Um, maybe not in actual ball in play, but, you know, at the end of the day, we all know how, you know, being on your feet and adding that into the mix. I mean, I played around the golf the other day and that was horrendous. I felt like I'd you know, trained really hard and I'd only walked around a golf course. So add into that the length of time that you might take to play a tennis match, it's difficult to compare. But yeah, my short answer, although that wasn't that short, would just be that squash is harder, but I'm probably biased. Um, what's the best advice you've had from David Pearson? Well, oh gosh, I don't... There's so many. I mean, how do I pick? Um, I mean, I, D, like DP's biggest, uh, biggest strength, I feel, like two biggest strengths. One is his unbelievable eye to be able to see what's going on in the swing. I mean, his eyes basically like that slow-mo app I was just talking about before. Um, he could see things that no one else could really see in normal speed. It's crazy. So... Um, I guess in terms of best advice, it would be sort of like the best technical advice that I can get. And, you know, I've been watching a lot of, of snooker this week for anyone who's not in the UK. It's the world champs in Sheffield. Um, it's probably the only snooker I watch, but um, I watch a lot of snooker. I've been watching a bit of golf as well. And I think the one thing that sticks out through sports is you need a swing that is as simple as it can possibly get. I, for me, Noor Shabini has the most simple swing you can get. And it looks easy, but it's not. Like, so she can play all of these shots and she's amazing. She obviously got great touch as well, but the swing um, is so simple. Um, and simplicity brings consistency. And I felt like DP gave me that with my swing. Um, you know, so when I'm watching the snooker and watching Ronnie O'Sullivan, even he's talking about his cue action, which is obviously similar. 
And he's like, there's something off with my cue action. I mean, I'm thinking, how much can you get this wrong? It's just the cue that kind of goes through like that. But he's talking about his swing. And he actually said the other day, the more moving parts there are to a swing, you're in trouble. And that's something as simple as snooker and golf where you're actually not the ball's not moving and you're not moving so then add into that squash where the ball's moving and you're moving and then you've got to play a swing the more stuff that's going on with your swing the less chance you have of repeating the swing the same way and getting the same result with the ball so the best advice that dp gave me was he gave me a simple repeatable consistent swing um and that's what I'm most thankful for to have as my coach. He understood that. And secondly, I said those two things. Secondly, he coached me knowing my strengths and my weaknesses, both mentally and kind of within my squash. So I felt like he coached me in a different way to the way he would have coached Nick, who was a different personality to me. Um, he will coach the same things, um, I'm sure, but they would be of kind of said and delivered in a different way because he was very good at understanding the relationship between player and coach. I hope that makes sense. Uh, why did you decide to retire? It's just time. Uh, <laughs> I mean, no, I, as I said before, um, I played to win. Um, I have done since I was a junior. Um, I loved, I loved winning. Um, winning was, um, the best thing about playing winning titles and maybe that's why kind of people always said I was quite mentally strong because I would fight to get that win more than anything and I hated losing so much that it kind of I was always trying not to lose as well as trying to win um and I just wasn't I just wasn't playing a good enough level anymore I feel like I was you know 35 36 that's you know, relatively old for any kind of athlete, particularly in a sport that's so physical. And, and I'm really proud that I managed to actually get as far in my, um, you know, I didn't have to retire at 30 or my level didn't just drop off a cliff because um, I hadn't kept up with like my, the physicality. And so in some ways it sort of hid it a little bit. The fact that I was so fit and strong and um, I didn't get a lot of injuries. It hid the fact that I was slowly dropping away a little bit, which, I'm grateful for, but I'm also it made the decision to retire kind of hard because I didn't know if it was the right one. But the last season or so, the inconsistency of the results, people who, when I was at my best, kind of didn't feel like um, they would have got as close to me when I was at my best or people or the odd loss to people who I just didn't think I would have lost to at my best. And, and they beat me fair and square, but it kind of was tough to take because I didn't feel like I'd given it my best on court because I just couldn't anymore. So from that perspective, the retirement decision came quite easy because um, I just wasn't winning and I wasn't in contention for winning in any of those really big major titles anymore. And I didn't want to be playing if I wasn't in contention for winning. So yeah, that was the decision to retire. It's not for everyone, but that was my personal choice. Um, is there a place in the world where you haven't played squash but would like to? Well, just said Moscow, uh, had a question there. I've never played in South Africa or South America for that matter. Um, would love to go to all of those places. I would also love to go to Japan. I've never been to Japan to play squash. Um, I think that's it. Um, I've been most, I've been to most places um, and they're the ones that stick out. I mean, South Africa is unbelievable. South America, Japan, I hear is unbelievable. I'd love to experience it as would be Russia. So yeah, I've played, I've played in most of the places that I would have really liked to have played actually. Uh, what was the score when you played golf? Ooh, well, um, technically it was my first ever round. So it was pretty rubbish. I'm not actually even sure I took. Danny didn't let me play with anything more than a six iron. Um, <laughs> I'd been to the driving range one, once. I didn't even want to play. And Danny sort of said, come on, we need to go and get you. And I just thought I'm not even going to be able to hit it. But I did. I enjoyed it. It was pretty good. Um, genuinely don't think I kept score. Danny's quite a good golfer. Um, we just played on a local, um, a local course nearby. But I really enjoyed it. I was probably averaging about six or seven shots a hole but bear in mind I wasn't let loose on a driver and I reckon that would have changed it um but I was pretty happy with that because you know it probably took me three to get to the green um 
and I only hit one bunker. And I, and I think the biggest thing is I only lost one ball, which, you know, considering it was my first round, I feel like that was pretty positive. I hope. <laughs> what was your favorite tournament to play in? Uh, it's a toughie. Everyone always says tournament of champions, don't they? I never played the one in front of the pyramids, which was a shame, but it just didn't work out. I think it has to be Shanghai. Um, the first time I went and I won it and we had a court on the 16th floor of the Peninsula Hotel, the best hotel I've ever stayed in by far. Not by far because the Ritz-Carlton in, in Qatar was a tournament hotel one time. It was also very good. But Peninsula Hotel, the glass court was up outside on the 16th floor and it overlooked the Bund with all of the colours and the buildings and everything um, and I've got this super cool picture of um, so Mohammed won it the same year that I won it for the first time and for the presentation they took us up to the helipad on the top of the Peninsula Hotel and we've got this really cool someone took a picture of me taking a selfie of me and Mo on this helipad with our trophies with the bun behind it's such a cool picture so I think because I won it as well and then that experience of the helipad and everything and just the hotel and the setting and I think it kind of goes down as my favorite favorite event yeah probably and just to be different from like grand central as well um hi what uh, where do you see yourself in five years time Ooh, it's a toughie um so yeah i guess I, i've been retired a year now although it's it's not technically a year is it because the tour stopped so i've been t in time it's been a year in tour time it's still not a year but um I hope to just be kind of further down the line where I am now. Um, I get honestly sort of been coaching a year and I feel like I've learned so much in that year. So what I'm coaching now is different to what I was coaching a year ago, not because I've changed my mind, but just because I think I learn, I've learned different things. So I'm, I'm big on the movement side. I, I, I'm a big believer in that, you know, if you can't move on a squash court, then you can't get balls back. And then it doesn't matter how good your balls are necessarily, does it? Because if someone can get them back, then that. So I've been, a lot of my coaching is around, you know, making sure the swing's decent, obviously, but it's about making sure that you're moving well. How, you know, can you protect the tee? How, you know, are you running around a squash court or are you moving? So um, five years down the line, I'd hope to have, you know, learn a bit more even, um, not necessarily about the movement, but how to help people learn it. Um, you know, maybe thinking about having a family and um, been retired a year. So kind of, you know, didn't want to go diving into anything too soon. So definitely, um, you know, looking forward to kind of that side of things. Um, and then just growing squash in my local area, I hope, and making people enjoy the game a little bit more. And yeah, really looking forward to continuing on the same path and just kind of just learning as I go. Um, what are you watching on Netflix at the moment? <laughs> um, oh, Netflix is a tough, what am I watching on Netflix at the moment? Uh, does it have to be Netflix? Because I got a Mac in lockdown because I, because I was doing my YouTube channel and, um, I was trying to do iMovie. And so I bought a Mac and with my Mac, I got a year's Apple TV included. And I got completely addicted to the morning show um, on Apple TV with Jennifer Aniston and Reese Witherspoon and Steve Carell. Can't recommend it enough. It was brilliant. As the quickest I've watched a series in a car remember. It was so good. Um, I've also watched the BBC doc um, series, Mrs. America. We're watching that at the moment, Danny and I. Um, so that's been really good as well. I've watched quite a lot of stuff on. I've been watching movies on Netflix actually. Watched The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. That was quite cool. True, I love true stories. Um, Twelfth Man was also a good movie. Uh, you just forget, don't you? But loads of stuff. <laughs> um, if you were stuck on a desert island and could only bring three items with you, what would you bring? Oh, that's so tough. Um, can, does my phone count? Cause then I can do a lot with that, can't I? Guess my phone. Uh, does Danny count as an item? <laughs> Maybe just for some company and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, I'm not sure what else would I bring to Desert Island. Um, could it? 
my coffee machine. I mean, do we have electricity or not? Because that's two items out, really. <laughs> um, but Danny would definitely be on there. And maybe um, probably like, a you know, s- some books or something, which would be really cool because I read a lot. And that's another thing going in my autobiography, all of the books I've ever written, and there's over 100. So it should be a good good little thing at the end. Um, so that's it, guys. Uh, we've come to the end of our hour on my Facebook live chat. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm hoping that I'll see you soon um, somewhere in the world on a squash tournament or maybe on my book tour eventually when that happens. But um, until then, I hope everyone stays safe. I hope you've enjoyed the Q&A and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.